Welcome to the 2021 Convocation Ceremony of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of the graduating class, the faculty and staff of the school, welcome to all family and friends who have joined us today. We are so honored you could share this special event with us. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the great privilege of, of uh, serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. It is strange to think that this is the second convocation we've marked in this virtual space. The COVID crisis has been with us over a year now. It has changed much. By now, many of us know someone who was infected by COVID or who died from it. Some of you likely had the virus yourselves. In the face of this, we have embraced new ways of living. We have kept our physical distance. We have waited for the day when the virus is under control and we can once again meet. That day, hopefully, is close. Vaccines have put an, the end of the pandemic in sight. Until then, we continue to keep our physical distance in anticipation of when we can finally fully be together in person. When this day comes, there will be an understandable urge to forget what we have just been through. Certainly, such forgetting will be impossible for the many who have personally been affected by COVID. But for others, moving forward will mean letting the trauma of COVID slip our collective mind. This is human nature. We do not like to think about difficult subjects. We do so when we are forced to, but when the pressure eases, we tend to turn away. There is a novel I've been thinking about lately, The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. The novel takes place on an island where a strange force makes people forget about everyday objects. These objects are then removed from the island by the memory police, along with any people who still remember them. Gradually, this gets more sinister as inhabitants start forgetting body parts and then their own existence after which they vanish. This well captures the danger of forgetting and how easily we can slide toward it. First, there is forgetting the everyday, the seemingly quotidian. From there, it is a short step to forgetting fundamentals, to losing the understanding that supports our very lives. This is the danger we face as COVID fades. As we resume the trappings of pre-COVID life, we may forget the details of this year, the distancing, the masks, Zoom. Then comes forgetting the broader lessons of the pandemic, the need to address the societal shortcomings that made the crisis worse. This is the dangerous kind of forgetting. With this forgetting comes the risk of learning nothing from COVID and having to face a similar disaster all over again. To avoid this fate, I suggest there are five key lessons we need to remember from this moment. First, the COVID moment has been an undeniable triumph of biomedical science. In public health, we often talk about how our society tends to emphasize the promise of medical technology at the expense of addressing the structural forces that shape health. That is very much true. But the swift development of treatments and vaccines reflects the key importance of medicine. It is a reminder that public health's aim should not to be to minimize medicine, but to harmonize a focus on the social determinants of health with the science of treatment. Second, the pandemic exposed the society of health haves and health have nots. COVID did not threaten everyone equally. From the beginning, it was worse for communities of color, those with less money, those with underlying conditions. These health gaps long predated the pandemic and they remain with us even as COVID winds down. Third, the consequences of mitigating COVID were as unequal as the effects of the virus itself. To slow the spread of COVID, we adopted lockdowns and shuttered large sectors of the economy. This has disproportionately burdened the socioeconomically vulnerable. While those at the top of the economic ladder have largely recovered or even seen financial gain, the less well-off continue to suffer. Taken with the health gaps exploited by the pandemic, the story of COVID has been from the start a story of inequality. Fourth, we face far more than COVID. The pandemic unfolded in a society already dealing with many health threats. Opioids, obesity, gun violence, mental illness. These are just a few of the overlapping epidemics threatening health in this country. It is worth remembering that when COVID struck, the US had already seen a three-year decline in life expectancy, the first such decline since the 1918 flu pandemic. Again, this was before COVID. The passing of the virus will not return us to some golden age of health, not even close. Instead, it will return us to a country where there is still much to be done to improve health. 
And finally, it is important to remember when thinking of COVID that it could have been much worse. I realize this is difficult to consider. It is hard to think anything could be worse than that we have seen this past year. But the fact is, COVID was actually not very lethal. It was very contagious. But compared to other diseases like SARS, or even going back further, the bubonic plague, it was a much less effective killer. This was purely a matter of luck. There is nothing preventing the next contagion from being as infectious as COVID and as deadly as any of the worst plagues humanity has faced. This is why we cannot forget the lessons of COVID. We cannot let ourselves be unprepared for what we know is coming next. As public health graduates, it is your job to make sure we do not forget. We need to apply the lessons of COVID to the creation of a healthier world. This year is the 45th anniversary of the Boston University School of Public Health. This anniversary has been an occasion for remembering the foundations of public health, which are inextricable from the mission of our school. This mission is to improve the health of populations with special care for the marginalized and vulnerable. We pursue this mission by working to improve the socioeconomic context in which we all live. This work is essential to creating a world where contagion can no longer take hold. Preventing the next pandemic means creating vaccines and effective treatments, yes. But more centrally, it means tackling inequality, ending racism, inve investing in public health infrastructure, and creating a just society. We are so proud that you, our soon-to-be graduates, have chosen to dedicate yourselves to this work. Thank you. Yesterday, we held an award ceremony to honor graduates who exemplified commitment to this work through significant academic performance and by making especially valuable contributions to the life of the school. Please join me in offering congratulations to the award winners for their achievements. Today, we celebrate the accomplishments of all our graduates by awarding them their hard earned degrees. It is my great pleasure to begin this celebration by introducing appropriately our student speaker. Each year at Convocation, we choose an outstanding student to speak on behalf of the graduating class. We look for a student who has achieved academic excellence and has also done distinguished work in other areas of student life. This year's student speaker is Cheyenne Bailey. In nominating Cheyenne to be this year's student speaker, one of her peers wrote, I believe Cheyenne Bailey represents what it truly means to be a leader at the forefront of public health. In the beginning of her MPH, Cheyenne Bailey already managed and led logistics that supported the overall well being of all students in the BUSPH community. Her passion to address public health issues, including chronic health, mental health, and racism, shortly led to her being one of the few selected as the Neighborhood Empowerment through Storytelling and Advocacy Fellows at the Activist Lab and the public health research writer for Power of Patients a traumatic brain injury awareness organization. Cheyenne also uses her own platform to create impactful infographics of BLM resources to educate and push others towards action for systemic change. This led to no surprise when she became the Anti-Racism Research Fellow through the Center for Anti-Racism Research at BU this year. Cheyenne Bailey not only takes advantage of all BU speeches to offer, she also takes the lead and empowers others to do the same. As the current president of the Students of Color at BUSPH, she has planned and facilitated numerous events to support the whole community. Cheyenne Bailey best embodies BUSPH's mission and values in being a strong, kind, inspiring, and compassionate public health leader. She makes me and others want to be in a world of public health and her leading it. I am truly proud to present Cheyenne Bailey, our student speaker for 2021. Cheyenne, over to you. Thank you so much, Dean Galea, for that beautiful introduction. Graduates, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, and family, it is truly an honor to be here today as the student speaker for the class of 2021 convocation. Today, I want to focus on the word community. So graduates, I have a few questions to ask you. Do you want all people to live their fullest and healthiest lives? Do you want communities to have the resources that they not only need, but deserve? 
Do you want to make a difference, no matter how small, to right the wrongs done by those before us? Do you want to work in tandem with people to advocate for the change that they want to see in their communities? If the answer is yes, you understand the core principles of community health and you understand the challenges ahead of us. Now let me share what I've learned about community. When I told my mother that I was the student speaker at graduation, she said, your grandmother would be so proud of you. She couldn't see it, but tears welled in my eyes as I thought about my grandmother and how my presence here today is a direct product of her story. My grandma was born in Belize, Central America to a poor religious family. She lived in a tight knit community where people knew her and her family for the delightful smells that came from their bakery. After getting married and having kids, my grandmother traveled to the United States where she earned a job as a domestic worker in New York City. My grandmother received help from her boss to set up space to which she endeavored to bring her family. And she had eight kids and could not afford to get them all at once. So she traveled 3000 miles between the US and Belize multiple times. And each time she brought a set of her children. While my grandmother was away, my mom and her siblings were taken care of by family members and anxiously awaited their turns to go to this new country. See, my grandmother believed that the US would give her and her family more than she could get in Belize. And she believed it so strongly that she encouraged others, friends and family in her home community to join her. My family often jokes that she was like Harriet Tubman traveling back and forth to assist others in achieving better opportunities. I often think about her decision to leave Belize. Was she afraid? How did she fare on the journey to a foreign land? What did she see? I think about her leaving all she had known for a better life for her children and a desire to see her community live in better conditions as well. My grandmother's story is of an immigrant's perseverance. She taught me valuable skills such as what community truly means. She would go out of her way to help and provide resources for others. When I was younger, I spent the majority of time at my grandmother's house and people came in and out of her home like a revolving door. They took moments of their time to spend with Miss Marge as they called her. And sometimes my grandma would instruct us to give a plate of food for her guests or to deliver it to their houses if they couldn't come to her home. She sat in the window every day and this was her favorite place to be, but people would walk by and wave and talk to her as she passed. And my grandma lent a listening ear, spending quality time hearing the frustrations, misfortunes and joys that others were facing in their lives. And she invested in the people around her. She gave them a space to stay if they were displaced. She gave them money for their endeavors when she had it and she advocated for them. My grandma embodied the true spirit of community and she fed people both spiritually and literally. And they needed it because we lived in an underserved, often forgotten about and resource lacking area where people did not have enough food, lived in less than adequate housing conditions and we needed each other to fill in the gaps. My grandma was there to help and she helped me understand what it meant to give yourself to your community. I learned the importance of community and the value of having love for your community. And what I learned from her would make even more sense years later when I was stricken with a chronic condition. And I spent years trying to understand the chronic pain symptoms that often left me debilitated. And I accepted that I would probably live like this for the rest of my life. Various practitioners left me helpless. They did not address my concerns and I didn't know where to get help. But I also knew that I was not the only person that had these problems. I knew that there were others out there facing the same issues I had and who was advocating for them? Who was showing them that they cared? Who was telling them what to do? I wanted to learn how to advocate for myself and help others advocate for themselves. These are my questions. And then I discovered the discipline of public health and Boston University School of Public Health. During open house, Dean Galea told a story about a black lower income musician who was impacted by a lot of problems and asked, why did he die? Was it his own actions? Was it the people and environment that he was around or was it the systems and the cultures of the time that let him down? I felt seen. 
I remember being in my seat and feeling seen because Dean Galea was talking about how an individual can get to a particular health outcome, how these health outcomes impact an entire community. He spoke about experiences and barriers that I know about, for instance, being black in a predominantly white run society, being seen as less intelligent, people thinking my health concerns are false and made up being poor, fighting my health insurance to approve the care that I needed. In many ways, Dean Galea described who I was, issues my communities face, and how all these factors, barriers, or exposures work together to create negative health outcomes, such as higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, and gun violence. At BUSPH, I began to put language to the injustices that communities like mine faced, and this was not easy. Each discussion challenged me to face the stories of a community that I had left miles away. When we talked about immigrant health in Professor Belanoff's class, I was reminded of my own family, an Afro-Caribbean neighborhood, and how no one knows much about their health. Knowledge about them is non-existent. I saw my struggles and that of my communities in every single example. I could put names and faces to all of the conditions that we studied, and that infuriated me. It infuriated me because people deserve more, more than they have, more than they've been given, and it increased my desire to help and serve my community. At times, the journey through this program was uncomfortable, sometimes overwhelming and draining. It was too much sometimes to hear about Black women having higher preterm death rates or the incidence and prevalence of opioid overdoses in Massachusetts, or how people with chronic conditions often have to choose between their medication and feeding their families. It was too much having too many school projects due at the same time and not having enough time to de-stress with my friends. This program has knocked me down, but it has also lifted me up. It was all necessary. This program has shown me examples of what I want to be and the work that I like to do. And I bet some of you, most of you, Actually, I bet all of you can relate to exactly what I'm talking about. I'm so thankful for the community that I have cultivated here, and I know that these relationships will extend beyond this physical space. To my squad, Allison, Edward, and Connor, thank you for uplifting me when I only saw darkness. To my housemates for helping me, listening to me, and encouraging me through some of the hardest moments of my life. For my students of color for public health community who has shown up and committed to making this place a better space for the next group of public health professionals. And to Dean Cox for guiding me through this process, to every single relationship I have developed here, you are all a part of my community and my story. So when I think about public health, community is the first word that comes to mind. And it's not because I was in the CAPD concentration. I think about how every single one of us graduates was drawn to this degree because in some way, we have the word community within our hearts. We all care about something, some group, some body, some community. When we talk about community, we are talking about people who live in the same space or share a common characteristics, or perhaps they share a common set of problems. But we're also talking about people who share a feeling of fellowship and relationship with others. In this graduating class today, there are people who want to be doctors, lawyers, health educators, policy analysts, and they want to address issues such as healthcare reform, environmental racism, emergency management, police reform. And for each of these situations and so many others, there is a community, a community of people, a community that has needs, concerns, and wishes. Our program has taught us the value of working within and among these communities. We've learned the complexities of navigating such complex issues. And we also understand that there are times where we will work with people and groups that are different than ourselves. And frankly, there are challenges to working with people who are different than me. In order to work with them effectively, I must listen to them more carefully. I have to understand their culture. I have to find appropriate ways to talk to them and I have to find appropriate ways to engage them in the problems. Graduates, you and I have to remember that people in communities must decide the changes that they would like to see 
and make decisions for themselves. And I must admit there are times where I really wonder if I'm prepared to do this work. But at the same time, I believe that the program at BUSPH has given me the skills to get started. And I know that you and I must do the important work of continuing to learn and grow so that we can work effectively with the communities with which we are concerned. And we must also continue to challenge our society to unlearn the ways of oppressive systems such as racism, classism, ableism, and the like, and to make better conditions for the world. And we also have to do the individual work to make significant differences in the world, such as leading vaccination efforts and helping folks get vaccinated in Massachusetts like Dean Galea and my friend Allison, or helping Boston residents work on storytelling and advocacy projects like Dean and Fiddler. The world is our community and there is so much to be done. So let me end in the same place that I started this speech. Do you want all people to live their fullest and healthiest lives? Do you want communities to have the resources that they not only need, but deserve? Do you want to make a difference, no matter how small, to right the wrongs done by those before us? Do you want to work in tandem with people to advocate for the change that they want to see in their communities? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you understand the core principles of community health. There is so much that needs to be done for and with our communities. And I am confident that we will make an impact if we never forget the importance of and love for community. Congratulations. Cheyenne. Thank you. I, I, I cannot tell you how moving I found that speech. If we can, um, in, uh, for all students, as they are with us at the school, we can help you all find your language of public health. We can help you find the words, the vocabulary, the how to act so that you can create a healthier world. Our work here will be done. Thank you from the bottom of all our hearts. Thank you. It is now my great uh, privilege to call on Professor Lisa Sullivan, our Associate Dean for Education, to present the Leonard Glantz Award for Academic Excellence and the Norman, Norman Scotch Award for Excellence in Teaching. Dean Sullivan. Thank you. It is my distinct pleasure to present the Leonard H. Glantz Award for Academic Excellence. This award is given annually in honor of Leonard Glantz, former professor of health law, bioethics, and human rights, and former associate dean for academic affairs. Professor Glantz is a gifted teacher of great intellectual integrity. In naming a recipient for the Glantz Award, members of the faculty have chosen a student who demonstrates exceptional academic performance, creative and critical thinking, the ability to integrate different areas of public health, and overall seriousness and professionalism. I'm pleased to announce the recipient of the 2021 Leonard Glantz Award for Academic Excellence is Hiba Abusliman. Throughout her time at SPH, Hibba has exemplified excellence. Here are a few of the things Hibba's instructors said of her in recommending her for this award. She is one of those rare students who equally combines emotional and academic intelligence with passion and motivation. She will no doubt be a leader in the field of public health. Not only is she an outstanding student, but she is a strong advocate and a true leader. Honestly, she gives me hope for our country and world because she reminds me that there are energetic, compassionate, undaunted champions of social justice who have what it takes to lead us beyond this rather dark era of injustices and ever widening inequities. It is my pleasure to present the 2021 Leonard H. Glantz Award for Academic Excellence to Hiba Abusliman. Thank you so much, Dean Sullivan. Thank you to everyone who I've had the joy of learning from and alongside during my time at BUSPH. To me, this is a reflection of everything I've learned from you all. And I was composed until I heard my mom crying a couple of rooms over. So thank you on behalf of my family as well. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations to you. The Norman A. Scotch Award, named in honor of our founding dean, was established in 1992 
It is the most distinguished teaching award given by the School of Public Health, and it is prized by our faculty. At SPH, excellence in teaching was one of the core principles set forth by Norm Scotch, who passed away in November of 2014. His strong belief in the importance of public health education helped shape the school's emphasis on teaching, and it remains one of our hallmarks. We think that every time a student enters our classrooms, he or she should have access to a qualified and committed teacher. This year's Scotch Award winner, Monica Onyango, was nominated by students, faculty, and administrators alike. Dr. Onyango has over 25 years experience in healthcare delivery and management. At the Department of Global Health, she teaches courses in managing disasters and complex humanitarian emergencies and in sexual and reproductive health in disaster settings. Her experience includes Kenya Ministry of Health for 10 years as a nursing officer in management positions at two hospitals and as a lecturer at the Nairobi's Medical Training College School of Nursing. Monica is also a registered nurse by the Massachusetts Board of Nursing. In 2011, she co-founded the Global Nursing Caucus at BUSCH with a mission to advance the role of nursing in global health practice, education, and policy through advocacy, collaboration, engagement, and research. Her current research interests focus on reproductive health, maternal and child health, HIV AIDS, healthcare among populations affected by disasters, and the role of nurses and midwives in improving health status of populations globally. It is my pleasure to present the 2021 Scotch Award for Excellence in Teaching to Monica Onyango. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks to all our wonderful students, my colleagues, faculty and staff. I'm very humbled, deeply appreciative, and especially today, my daughter who is 13 years old is here with me watching and it couldn't be a better time. Thanks to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Sullivan. Um, congratulations, Heba. Congratulations, Professor Onyango. And uh, for Professor Onyango's daughter, it'll be good for you to know your mother is outstanding. Okay. Um, um, it is my great pleasure now to move on and introduce Professor Mike McLean. Dean McLean is the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Advancement, and he will present the Faculty Award for Excellence in Research and Scholarship. Dean McLean. Thank you, Dean Galea, and congratulations to all of our graduates. Each year, the Boston University School of Public Health awards a faculty award for excellence in research and scholarship. This honor recognizes a faculty member for outstanding scholarly or scientific work on a specific topic or within a general area of expertise. This year, it is my pleasure to present this award to Professor Roberta White. Roberta White is a transdisciplinary scientist whose research focuses on the effects of exposure to industrial pollutants on brain function. Her work has had significant public health impact in setting standards for occupational exposure to lead, environmental exposure to methylmercury in utero, and acceptance of Gulf War illness as a physical illness related to chemical exposures in theater. She has written extensively on the clinical correlates of encephalopathies caused by exposure to chemical pollutants and co-wrote the World Health Organization criteria for diagnosis of solvent encephalopathy that are used internationally. Among her many colleagues who reached out to nominate her for this award, one of them wrote, Bobby has taken on leadership roles nationally and internationally, including as science, scientific director of the Congress, congressionally mandated research advisory committee on Gulf War illness from 2008 to 2015. In addition, as chair of the Department of Environmental Health from 2003 to 2017, and Associate Dean for Research from 2008 to 2015, Bobby helped grow the research infrastructure at SPH with the associated legacy of scholars who benefited from her activities. In all respects, Bobby is an ideal candidate for the Faculty Award for Excellence in Research and Scholarship. It is truly a privilege to award the 2021 SPH Faculty Award for Excellence in Research and Scholarship to Professor Roberta White. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, uh, it's wonderful to receive this war award and very humbling, and it's especially a treat to get it from you. 
Um, I would like to say, though, that I really think this um, the work that you talked about was done by hundreds of people um, and facilitated by staff at all levels and administrative people, my brilliant collaborators and colleagues and students, and I might add students who became colleagues. Um, and finally, I would just like to congratulate all of the graduates. Um, I hope that BU has given you the preparation and inspiration that it gave me um, in my 41 years here. Um, best wishes to all of you. Thank you. Congratulations, Professor White. Thank you for everything you've done. It's now my great uh, privilege to um, introduce Dean Ira Lazic, Associate Dean for Administration and Finance, to present the Zidra Connect Staff Award for Distinguished Service to the Boston University School of Public Health. Dean Lazic. Thank you, Dean Dalia. It is my pleasure and privilege to present the Zidra J. Connect Award. This award recognizes staff members who have made outstanding and sustained contributions to the administrative functioning of their departments and therefore the school. It is named in honor of Deidre J. Knick, the school's first associate dean for administration, who spent 30 years working for the university, 20 of them at SPH. I am thrilled to recognize Patricia Gonzalez, Patty as we know her, with the Deidre J. Knecht Award for Distinguished Service. Patty has been with SPH since 2017. In the various roles she's held at SPH, she has not only performed her job at an exemplary level, but she has continued to demonstrate an extraordinary commitment to our SPH community. At the onset of the pandemic and after the tragic loss of Karen Smith, Patty rose to the challenge of volunteering to cover additional duties and serve as the Director of Administration in SPH, on top of her role as Director of People Services for SPH. As difficult economic decisions had to be made as the pandemic evolved, Patty took on the additional responsibility of also serving as the Director of Administration for Global Health. Patty exhibits outstanding management skills and better yet, phenomenal people skills. She discerns quickly the needs of faculty and staff, not just within departments, but at the school level as well, and moves efficiently to provide key information, recommendations, or direction. Beyond this, and during times of transition, she has served as a wonderful ambassador for SPH in assisting faculty, students, and staff as they navigate administrative challenges at the university level. Patty is helpful, caring, resourceful, and happy to offer service no matter what the task is. Her go-getter character and her can-do attitude is an inspiration to all. Patty is the epitome of dare to soar, and I have learned from her that excellence is potential chiseled into a more perfect state through vision, dedication, and most importantly, determination. Patty, it is a pleasure and a privilege to work alongside you in support of our SPH community. Congratulations and thank you for all you do. Thank you, Dean Lajic. I'm truly honored and humbled to receive this award. Thank you to the SPH community for all of your support. Thank you. Congratulations, Patty. Congratulations. Thank you for everything you do. Um, I now call on Dean Craig Andrade, our Associate Dean for Practice, to present the Award for Excellence in Public Health Practice. Dean Andrade. Thank you, Dean Galea. The Award for Excellence in Public Health Practice is given to a faculty or staff member that has excelled in service to local community or demonstrated excellence in advocating for a public health issue. We offer this because our school prides itself in walking the talk and being actively engaged in public health issues in local and global communities. I am honored to present this year's award for excellence in public health practice to Monica Wang. Dr. Wang is an associate professor of community health sciences at Boston University School of Public Health, an adjunct professor of health policy and management at the Harvard T. Chang School of Public Health, and an Associate Director of Narrative at BU's Center for Anti-Racist Research. She is nationally recognized as a leader, leading health equity researcher in obesity and chronic disease prevention. She directs community-engaged research to target racial inequity in health and pursues cross-section sector collaborations to promote health and health equity through public health interventions and policies. 
At the national level, she advances science communication initiatives through her role as former chair and current member of the Civic and Public Engagement Committee of the Society of Behavioral Medicine. For, three reason, for these reasons, it is my proud honor to give the award of excellence in public health practice to Monica Wang. Dr. Wang, congratulations on your well-deserved award and thank you for all of your efforts to, on behalf of the school. Monica, it is truly an honor to call you colleague. Again, congratulations. Thank you. It's truly an honor and a privilege to work at an institution that values and celebrates faculty and staff to engage in this type of translational work to accelerate change and maximize impact. Professor Thank Wang, you. congratulations. Thank you for everything you do. It's now my great privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for this convocation, Dr. Cheryl Scott. Dr. Cheryl Scott has had a career in public health that is truly distinguished. After graduating from Boston University School of Medicine in 1982, her early work included studying reproductive outcomes of women affected by the Three Mile Island meltdown, helping to address complications among HIV infected patients enrolled in early clinical trials in Roosevelt Island, New York City, and caring for residents in Harlem homeless shelters. After that, she began an assignment with the National Health Service Corps in St. In Saint Croix, helping residents recover after Hurricane Hugo. She then joined she then joined CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service and the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. During her two decades as a USPHS medical officer, she helped shape state and national policies around maternal and child health, worked to address HIV AIDS as well as transmission of multidrug resistant tuberculosis, and responded to disasters in multiple parts of the world. From 1993 to 1995, Dr. Scott served as a CDC member of the UN High Commission on Refugees. She was later seconded to the U.S. Department of State as the inaugural CDC Director of the United Republic of Tanzania. Dr. Scott then worked with the California Department of Public Health Multidrug Resistant Tuberculosis Service, where she helped lead efforts to detect and manage cases in the state. Most recently, she joined the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, where she works as a medical consultant in women's health, family planning, and HIV AIDS. In other words, in summary, Dr. Scott has had an exemplary career in public health. The world is a better, healthier place because of Dr. Scott's example and her work. It is really my distinct honor to call on Dr. Cheryl Scott to give the keynote speech of this year's convocation. Dr. Scott. Thank you. Good afternoon and what a momentous day. Thank you, graduates, faculty, and friends. Thank you, Dean Galea, for the honor of inviting me as this year's commencement speaker. Congratulations, graduates. Your hard work and sleepless nights have paid off and you're entering a profession that is in demand, overtaxed, under scrutiny, but never more critically needed. Congratulations to your families, your friends, your partners, your teachers who challenged you and to your known and unknown ancestors who blazed this path for you so you could navigate through this demanding year. You all stand on the shoulders of phenomenal public health practitioners from all over the world. Recognize how extraordinary it is to have acquired academic experience and your public health degree from the Boston University School of Public Health. We're centering human rights and social justice, envisioning global health futures and catalyzing big ideas are standing priorities. And when you add to this framework, your well-prepared hearts and minds, you have the most powerful tools necessary to transform the world. The COVID-19 public health crisis has forever changed each of us and our global community, and you deserve to exhale. Going there. You deserve to celebrate each step forward that has been delivered to you to this moment. Now you need to exhale and celebrate because the world is truly awaiting you. You're facing a world that through the pandemic redemonstrates that we are all one and our interdependence has never been more evident. And the COVID pandemic is not yet over. Things here and in other parts of the world even are better than 13 months ago, but it's not yet over. 2020 will be one of the most impactful public health learning experiences of your lifetime. 
and will serve as a cautionary tale to us all. In this pandemic, we've seen stark contrast to how institutions and governments have managed this public health crisis and witnessed yet again the painful truth that crises do not impact everyone equally and the ability to navigate crises or not depends on the social infrastructure. The question is, how will you go about ensuring that this social inequity does not worsen the future pan pandemics? As Dr. Galea described, I chose a public health career that led me to work with the CDC in the US and in global settings, and also with a few state health departments. So I'd like to share with you what I've learned about equity, humanity, and justice. This past year, I unexpectedly helped the South Carolina State Health Department manage COVID-19. Unexpectedly, I say, because I'm from Oakland, California, and went to South Carolina to help with maternal and child health, women's health, and HIV AIDS. I was, of course, very glad to help COVID emerge. That meant joining South Carolina's state emergency response team and planning for all things COVID, essentially for the past 13 months, and learning more about South Carolina line of politics than I had planned. State health departments are too often the underfunded implementing agencies of the CDC, so it required months to plan the distribution strategies for vaccines. Countless questions and considerations emerged at the state level during the COVID-19 management. Questions like, should an ombudsman in a hospital be vaccinated before at the same time as a nurse or a doctor? What about racial ethnic group transmission? How can you not prioritize by disproportionately high cases and mortality? What about Medicaid non-expansion? What does that mean for COVID and low socioeconomic status? What about COVID-19 in, and indigenous Americans residing on federal lands in your state? What's greater impact, vaccine hesitancy or lack of, excess, ac lack of access and eligibility? And isn't hesitancy just episodic bad experiences? So analyzing this dizzying array of considerations in pursuit of a fair and equitable public health decision and applying that logic throughout is the goal. Recognize that however you decide, groups that are not ranked and prioritized early are at risk of increased disease and death. So when I zoom out, pun intended, the lesson I still am processing from these many months becomes clearer that health equity cannot be an aspiration. It must be built into public health policy. So I say to you, as you begin to develop plans, procedures, programs, and policies in any public health setting, always consider and center equity. Let it guide you throughout. And let your logic be informed by medical and public health research and data. And as we've all learned, Politics should have no role in planning or delivering public health services for any populations, especially when residents are dying by the minutes. Have the courage to keep that foremost so that you can both safeguard and defend equitable practices and adherence to science. It will not always be easy, but it must be done. Even if your voice is the only voice, use it. Believe me, it really matters. Most importantly, it is critical that humanity remain at the core of public health always, not eccentric and not just core for some situations or for some groups. Recognition and tre treatment as a member of the human family is not a given. One horror of the pandemic is that it has not only testified to US history, but also to ongoing US realities. Throughout history, mankind has too often failed to value and protect the humanity at public health's core. A few examples. When I consider infant mortality and human rights, I recall a deep well 
into which women were forced to drop their infants before boarding slave ships off the coast of Zanzibar. This is a haunting reminder of the inhumanity to which we still subject each other. When I consider gun violence, I'm reminded of Dr. Bohr and Williams and others' work surveying who in the U.S. can see the youth and humanity of unarmed young black males. When I look at needed police reform, I feel my own humanity literally decimated by a policeman suffocating a man to death with the whole world watching. When I look at needed criminal justice system reform, I am stunned that the South Carolina legislature le voted last week to become one of four states to have an alternative to their electric chair for death row inmates. The alternative is a firing squad. When I consider COVID mortality and socioeconomic status, Dr. Susan Moore comes to mind, a black woman physician and COVID patient who was not listened to within a state's medical system and she died of COVID. And the health system reports now that their recognized lack of empathy and compassion to Dr. Moore did not contribute to her death. As we remove our masks, I can see the collective numbness that has replaced the horror that the US lost almost 600,000 American lives needlessly. I joined public health to help unmask these underlying inequities. I wanted a career in, public, in global health and started my work in the developing world where I, like you, was optimistic about the power of public health. I believed it could transcend geography, culture, and political lines. I was drawn to this uncharted territory and felt certain that I had the stamina and the patience for the slow, steady infrastructure building and the painstaking diplomatic collaboration. You likely learned about many of my mentors in your classes, people like D.A. Henderson, Bill Fagey, George Lithcott, working with smallpox eradication, David French and Al Haynes in global health. These were pioneers in their field at the time and I was uh, honored to have them mentor me. You may notice that these mentors were all men. Very few women were working internationally at that time. These circumstances did not unnerve me. Instead, it inspired me. I relied also on the fearlessness and love for other cultures that was given to me honestly by my trailblazing mother, who after high school in Dallas, Texas, worked with the Department of State as a stenographer during the Japanese war crime trials in Tokyo, Japan. Working with Dr. French in the Ivy Coast in the early 80s was priceless. There I traveled from village to village, sitting in the middle of the community, listening to friends and families of women who had died during childbirth tell me what they knew of the mother's story. Decades later, I recognized this work as the precursor to maternal mortality review committees that now many states convene to provide data and answers to our maternal mortality crisis. I worked years later in Tanzania with the CDC establishing a national antiretroviral program for a country with an HIV prevalence of over 10%. What I learned during these and other global health work is that we are all cells in one human body and that health inequity exists everywhere. Policies built on a framework of inequity are sustainable nowhere. Sometimes you may have to innovate practices to ensure data are reliably captured in novel settings, but it can be done, and usually by just small, creative, common sense methods. And regardless of politics, it is your responsibility as a public health worker to safeguard health equity and science from political influence for the work you are supporting to be worthwhile and sustainable. After decades of public health experience, what I've learned and want to share with you are uh, simple truths. We are on watch 
to defend our common humanity and to prevent any more harm caused by indifference, ignorance, fear, and greed. Regardless of what you choose to do within public health, you will come to find that your own humanity is what connects you to the communities you serve. As you move forward into rewarding careers, I want you to consider one final aspect of humanity, your own. This true story was told to me by my friend Ansela. During the years of township anti-apartheid battles in South Africa in the 70s, there were many child soldiers. There was a boy, 14 years old, his name was Justice. Yes, his name really was Justice, that's his name. He's an adult now and he told this story to Ansela. Justice was captured by South African soldiers and in the middle, in the mid 70s, the then Soviet Union had committed artillery and trainers to Angola nearby so that the Soviet soldiers trained Justice to be a child soldier. He was taught to do horrible, inhumane things as a child. After fighting for years and after the fall of apartheid, Justice and other boys were sent to the Maasai in Tanzania who were effective at retrieving mines. When he returned to his parents' home in South Africa, at the door, his mother insisted that Justice cut his arm. She wanted to see his blood because she believed she was encountering a ghost. He had arrived at dinner time and a place at the table was set for him because his father insisted that Justice's place be set every night because he believed Justice would come home. Justice then began working in South Africa as a mentor to child soldiers, now adults who are traumatized by what happened to them when they were children. Like Justice, when you recognize humanity displaced in you or in communities for whatever reasons, don't assume it is irreplaceable and work instead to recenter it. Oh, man. So public health work is difficult and rewarding. As public health professionals, you'll be forced to make difficult decisions and to see the world not as it is, but as it should be. And you will fight for that dream, making it real through science, data, and skill, and compassion. You will bring humanity to a world that sometimes forgets about people. And you will help to make communities whole. You will learn every day the value that people have and that what confirms their humanity is that they exist. And you will be led to serve communities who are voiceless. Make sure that your humanity remains at the core of your being and the center of your public health service. You chose this magnificent feel and make no mistake, it is magnificent. And it is imperative that you begin your work with the consciousness of how precious and sometimes fragile many of the communities are that you will serve. Your commitment to public health and the greater good will only return communities to a level of self-determination and it can also literally save the world. So congratulations, graduates. Remember to celebrate. Please go and plan tremendous public health careers. I am waiting to watch and hear because I know that each of you is destined to make our world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for uh, amazing words and really thank you for everything you have done throughout your whole career for the health of the public. You are, as you've always been for me, a real inspiration. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I um, have often said that today, our day of commencement, is the happiest day of the year. I really think it is the happiest day of the year in the academic calendar. Now, the happiest moment of the happiest day of the year is when we award degrees to our graduates, degrees they have earned through their hard work and dedication. And it is my great privilege to call on Dean Lisa Sullivan, our Dean of Education, to introduce each of our graduates as we award our degrees to all of them. Dean Sullivan. Thank you, Dean Zalea. Candidates for the Master of Public Health. Hiba Abuslaman, Delta Omega. Nanthini Agarwal, Isaac Haynes Ackers, 
Brisa Alam, Delta Omega. George Edward Alexander II. Samir Khalid Ali Ahmad. Alejandro Daniel Alvarez. Kerwin Najib Omo. Rachel Rose Andreas. Bhavana Anapragada. Alexandra Arnold. Ada Gabriela Avila. Gray Babs, Delta Omega. Vanessa Bonham. Cheyenne Bailey. Savannah Bailey. Brian Hartman Baker. John Barbadoro. Caitlin Elizabeth Barnett. Michelle Baum. Mackenzie Ann Beaton. Madison Grace Beeler, Delta Omega. Emma Kristen Bianculi. Savannah Rose Vitsas, Delta Omega. Candace Bloomstrand. Rachel Bornstein. Jessica Marie Boopher. Matthew Benjamin Boykin. Charles Brandon. Stephanie Briggs, Delta Omega. Danny Brooks. Sophie Marie Brown. Mom Arava Ejira Badu. Tiffany Tuan V. Bui. Adrian Burnham, Delta Omega. Areli Vanessa Caballero Gonzalez. Stephen Anthony Calori. Delta Omega. Joseph Morris Candela. Caitlin Jane Cassidy. Sharmila Chamling Rai. Sri Ramya Chaparella. Mabel Cheng. Chun Cheng Chen. Alexandra Kratian. Mylin Clement. Therese Clover. Cameron Alexi Cooper. Whitney Joy Krebas. Janica Blaze Yi Hureg. Meredith Daily, Delta Omega. Kelly Dankert. Griffin Michael Danes. Bidisha Anup Das. Gopika Das. Monisha Dasgupta. Tahira Sultana Davalji Kanjikar. Stephanie De Jesus Capelan. Barbara Amir De La Cruz. Andrew Tyler Day. Sile Chandrashikar Dam. Mayuri Kiran Darn. Ashima Dogra. Shelby Lynn Dunkel. Valerie Dutrail. Alexia Andrine Edwards. C. 
Sarah Issa, Rebecca Elliott, Zoe Ennis, Michaela Estes, Elizabeth Morgan Ferrara, Laura Kathleen Fletcher, Melanie Floyd, Keridwin Foley, Delta Omega, Weston Gray Fox, Delta Omega, Margaret Marie Froden, Delta Omega, Jeremy Fryer Biggs, Jessica Rose Folks, Pleiss Loranis Fuchu, Lindsay Elizabeth Burton, Prerana Gaitonde, Nicole Alexis Gamboa, James Allen Gardner, Ashley Renee Gogan, Prabneet Kaur Gearn, Francesca Golightly, Evelyn Gonzalez, Camille Griffin, Zayu Guang, Lorenzo Guani, Delta Omega, Mia Haddad, Delta Omega, Emily Han, Delta Omega, Samantha Marie Hall, Delta Omega, Annie Hamilton, Delta Omega, Arthur Han, Walla Hayek, Margaret Hefferum, Brian Hermsmeyer James, Mark Hernandez, Delta Omega, Melinda Hicks, Cameron Hill, Delta Omega, Annie Hunger, Jonathan Hurtado, Mayuri Jane, Catherine Janiszewski, Caroline Jens, Catherine Octavia Garabek, Claire Margaret Johnson, Davina Kang, Rabia Khalid, Dylan Nicholas Kirby, Delta Omega, Anne Marie Kissel, Nicole Kitten, Delta Omega, Hannah Roos Kledgewich, Misaka Kobayashi, Taylor Cron, Suchitra Narayan Kulkarni, Ashley Lara, Jessica Lawrence, Adam Joseph Lasarchik, Annette Jean Lee, Cindy Lee, Jasmine Lee, Tayin Lee, Ariana Chayana Engel Lewis, Jiayu Lee, Sarah Lincoln, Xinyang Lu, Yilin Lu, Mallory Banks Loggins, Manvi Lohia, Savannah Carlin Lawrence, Megan Lauren Mariani, Case Kelsey Maselli. 
Rachel Maddie. Brian Taylor Mayville. Erin McSweeney. Haley McCabe. Anna McGregor, Delta Omega. Mackenzie McIntyre. Kara McKinney. Neve Meta. Gianna Ray Melillo. Mirva Modi. Cordelia Romina Su Sho Muir. Rinka Murakami. Julia Mary Neji, Delta Omega. Navleen Nauru. Julia Diane Nash, Delta Omega. Aileen Navaret. Jennifer Wen. Fuang Nok An Wen. Julia Oak. Kathleen Giovanna O'Brien, Delta Omega. Allison Rose O'Connor. Leona O'Fair, Delta Omega. Amanda Okaka. Debbie Olawui. Elise Olasinski, Delta Omega. Ashley Opat. Leanne Amy O'Reilly. Bright Osazeman Osaije. Sainath Pulani. Panisha Patel. Serena Sunit Patel. Tanme Patil. Tangina Patwari. Emma Penderi. Olivia Perone. Sarah Rose Petridas. Anna Dyer Patterson. Bala Niharika Pulalamari. Ginevra Pittman. Nicole Pollinger. Catherine Claire Price. Stefan Radovic. Rana Ramat. Janani Ramachandran, Delta Omega. Nikita Ramesh. Sneha Ramesh. Jade Ransohoff, Delta Omega. Adrian Regoza. Savannah Reitzel. Ivana Lynette Roca. Rachel Francis Rockelson. Crystal Roloff. Marguerite Irene Romatelli. Anuranda Sahu. Kevin Sakaguchi. Ariana Marissa Samalot. Natasha Sanchez. Wendy Lady Sanchez. Pavuni Sango. Natalia Sarkisova. Taylor Elizabeth Savage. Rachel Sheckman. Hannah Shansky. Hyo Jin Shin, Delta Omega. Nerisha Suduri. Jeremiah Silguero, Delta Omega. Anupalavi Sinha. Claire Brennan Sontheimer, Delta Omega. Anna Stanley Lee, Delta Omega. 
Kimberly Stevenson, Catherine Stewart, Taylor Michael Stivali, Navindu Kasun Suriyapuruma, Kirsten Marie Swanson, Megan Titro, Veronica Yvonne Top, Ozen Toy, Marlena Tulicki, Sophia Vinegar, Robin Volsi Lee, Erin Wade, Thelma Yeboa Wadia, Megan Walsh, Yachen Wang, Kara Francis Marie Washington, Theodore Wassel, Sarah Weber, Delta Omega, Tiffany Wei, Shelby Louise Luttinger Weinstein, Delta Omega, Rebecca Weintraub, Delta Omega, Olivia Grace Wellstead, Samuel Kumpel Wickham, Delta Omega, Bilkis Omoshilawa Williams, Jessica Wise, Elizabeth May Wolf, Nelson Wu, Zhu Yan, Shanila Yasmin, Delta Omega, Danjing Yin, Sabina Alana Yosef, Mark Zalzali, Dallas Harlov Zeichner, Ning Zhang. And now candidates for the Master of Arts in Biostatistics. Ross Goldberg, Orway Lee, Robert McDonough, Jawe Ruan, Benjamin Swigart, Xinyi Wang, Yi Jing Zhang. Candidates for the Master of Science in Applied Biostatistics. June Corrigan. Amanda Marie Ignacio. Yuxi Liu. Alexander Page. Yao Jing Peng. Lisa Piazeki. Jose Ignacio Rivero. Sarah Catherine Rogers. Morgan Elizabeth Ryan. Brienne Thompson. Yutong Su. Zinru Zhou. Candidates for the Master of Science in Epidemiology. Charlotte Rowe Doran. Kelsey Alice Egan, Jessica, sorry, Jessica Dickey Gurridge, Catherine Rebecca Standish, Marco Aguildo Torrey. Candidates for the Master of Science in Health Services and Systems Research, Connor Buckholz, Isha Desai, Delta Omega. Jorma McSwiggin Hong. Candidates for the Master of Science in Population Health Research. Amarachi Nikechinieri Abanobi. Quinn Adams, Delta Omega. Sharon Casey. Maura Claire Dodge. Sydney Kim, Delta Omega. 
Madison Raposa, Daniel Lewis Smithers, Delta Omega, Alejandro David Varela. We will now turn to our doctoral students. As I say the name of each doctoral student, we invite you to unmute yourself, say hello so that your screen comes to the forefront. We then invite your designated loved one to drape your graduation hood over you. We then ask that you remute yourself as we move on to the next name. To avoid confusion, please do not unmute early. Candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy in Biostatistics, Catherine Bloor. Hello. Right, go ahead, Dad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Alicia Xiao Yen Chua. I go on. Sarah Connor. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Meng Tian Du. Hi. Thank you. Congratulations. Pei Tao Wu. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> this happens in real life too. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah. Candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy in Environmental Health, Kamal Peer. Hello. Thank you. Candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy in Epidemiology, Ololade Adeola Ayudele. Hello. Congratulations. Alyssa Harlow. Hello. <laughs> Uh, this way. Oh, this way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tammy Jang, Delta Omega. Marlon Daniel Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. There you go. Okay, we got you. Congratulations. Sydney K. Willis, Delta Omega. Okay. Candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy in Health Services Research. Suji Choi. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. Uchenna Andulu. Yeah. 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 Hello. <laughs> Congratulations. Candidate for Doctor of Public Health in International Health. Tamara Crevacour. Hi. There you go. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Candidates for the Doctor of Public Health in Leadership, Management, and Policy, Emily George. Yay. Hi. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Tammy Lynn Govea. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Michelle Patricia Lewis. Hello. Yay. 
Congratulations. Thank you. Julie Model Santiago. Thank you. Woo! Congratulations, Julie. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of our graduates. Guests and faculty, please join me in a final round of applause for everyone who graduated today. We wish you all great success in everything you do. And now, if I may ask our graduates to applaud the friends, family, and faculty members who have helped them throughout their time at SBH. Congratulations, congratulations everybody. I also would like to recognize the School of Public Health staff who do such a wonderful work throughout the year and I'll do themselves for, this, for all convocations and particularly this one. I particularly want to thank the staff in our Graduate Student Life Office led by Mary Murphy Phillips who've done an outstanding job of coordinating complex arrangements for the ceremony and the Registrar's Office staff led by Nikki Long who have so ably managed student records, graduation applications and diploma production. And I would like to acknowledge the many alumni and friends of the school whose support makes possible everything we do. Please join me in a round of applause for all of them. And now it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce someone who will say a few brief words from one of our many colleagues, many friends in the field, many alumni. From an alum who once sat where all our graduates sit today, facing many of the same exciting challenges you're about to encounter as you begin this momentous journey. I would like to call one of our distinguished alums, Beth Summers. Elizabeth Summers is a senior acupuncturist and researcher in the Integrative Medicine and Health Disparities Program at Boston Medical Center. At BU School of Medicine, she's an assistant professor of family medicine. She holds degrees from our school and New England School of Acupuncture. She co coordinates an acupuncture clinic at Tufts Medical Center that provides free care for individuals living with HIV AIDS. She has published and lectured internationally in the areas of acupuncture, detoxification, related to substance use disorder, health economics, and treatment of individuals diagnosed with HIV AIDS. Her book, Acupuncture as an Adjuvant in Treatment of HIV AIDS was published in 2014. Dr. Summers is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine. She co-founded the APHA section on integrative complementary traditional health practices and currently serves on APHA's governing council, nomination committee, and intersectional council uh, opioid work group. Uh, Dr. Summers is a public health advocate committed to ensuring that healthcare including wellness is a right, not a privilege. We are truly delighted Dr. Elizabeth Sommers is joining us today. Beth. Thank you for your very kind words, Dean Galea. We know that in public health, words matter. And in the words of BUSPH, think, teach, do. I add the following word, repeat. Think, teach, do, repeat. These words become a mantra that is part of the legacy of BUSPH that you take with you as you begin your next chapter. They become a prescription for our lives, whether we become activists, scholars, researchers, or advocates for the health of this beautiful planet. Doors open and invite you to the public health experience we are public health. We embody the spirit of public health. Our passionate enthusiasm can lead to accomplishments and lifelong learning. Some of my favorite words that describe public health include dynamic, diverse, equitable, organic, evolving, nonlinear, Public health is not only multidisciplinary, it is transdisciplinary, whereby scholars become activists and advocates become researchers. As an acupuncturist and integrative health researcher, I tend to view the world in terms of the lens of mind, body, and spirit. For me, this aligns perfectly with think, teach, do. These words remind us of the ongoing process of reflection, mental digestion, and the transformation of our creativity into action 
that seeks to promote health justice for all. I asked Bob Knox, chair of our BUSPH Alumni Leadership Council, to share some of his words with the graduates today. I'll read his message. Bob says, I'm a proud BUSPH alum. Our mission is to support the BUSPH mission by engaging the global alumni community, strengthening alumni connection to the school and advance alumni passions, careers and work to improve the health of all. As the current chair of the ALC, please accept my sincere congratulations on your graduation and allow me to welcome you to the BUSPH alumni community, which now stands at over 11,000 strong. Our world today faces incredible challenges and now more than ever, we need all of you to choose to lead. The BU community is proud of your work so far and we're ready and excited to support you in your next adventures. Now is your time to do. So good luck, cause good trouble. And remember, this is the fun part. I wanna conclude my remarks with a special haiku that I wrote dedicated for today's graduates. If you follow Twitter, you may be familiar with my public health haiku. Here's the poem dedicated to graduates today. Kudos, graduates, your next chapter begins now. Remember, you're brilliant. Thank you, congratulations. I wish you every success, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Summers. That was terrific. And thank you for your hug. <laughs> that was perfect. Uh, it is uh, now my uh, great privilege to introduce, uh, reintroduce uh, Dean Craig and Ray, our Associate Dean for Practice, to uh, lead us on a call to service. Uh, if we were in person, we'd be doing this. Asking, I would be asking all the graduates to stand um, as we start thinking about the graduates now becoming the public health leaders of the future. Dean and Ray. Thank you, Dean Galea. Dear graduates, dear colleagues, so much has happened over the past year. Not only did you all navigate and finish a highly competitive graduate program, a pandemic happened to us, an economic crisis, a reckoning with racial injustice began for many following the murder of George Floyd. It's possible to think all of this just happened. But we in public health know this, the truth. The challenges of, past, of the past year, the flashpoints, the moments of reckoning, pain, progress, and yes, even finishing a grad school, they did not come out of nowhere. These struggles reflect problems that have been with us for some time. The social conditions that have made the pandemic so devastating have existed for generations. And where progress was won, it was made on the foundations built by activists and revolutionaries who came before. Now is the time for the whole country to wake up, not only with their eyes, but with their heart to these challenges. The problems we faced did not just happen to us, but in this moment, you, our graduates, have a chance to happen to them. You can influence the conditions that shape our health to make us better. You can change the status quo that kept so many sick. You can change the circumstances that make so many feel otherized and marginalized and disenfranchised. You can change the circumstances that make so many feel simply sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. You can build where it is necessary to build and disrupt where it's necessary to disrupt. You, every one of you are action figures with all the head, heart and superpower that the word, world needs more than ever before. And on this day, today, when milestones have been achieved, 
you can celebrate with friends and family, with those who have made, you have made so proud. Congratulations, my dear, dear colleagues. You are ready to meet the world as it is, and the world is waiting for you. Thank you, Dean and Braid. Thank you for those wonderful words. We are coming to the end of our convocation ceremony, but before we go, first, I would like to invite all faculty and staff to join me in raising a toast to our graduates, to honor your achievement, and also to honor and thank all the family and friends who have done so much to support you, to help, re help you reach this moment. Congratulations. As we raise our glasses, I have a final assignment for our graduates. It is the most important assignment of all. It is an assignment for you all to go and create a healthier world. As you do this, I hope you stay connected to the school. This is your school. This is part of your story. We are part of each other's story. Please be a part of what we do. Be a part of our health communication to public health post through a lifelong learning to population health exchange. Do be a part of the resources the school puts together so that we can keep our conversation with you going so that you stay current on what we're doing and we stay current with what we are doing. Once again, thank you for everything you have done in your time with us. And thank you for what you're going to be doing going forward. I'd also like to invite everybody here to take a look at the school's recorded ceremony with regalia and everything, and the page for student announcements that's going to go live today at two o'clock this afternoon. On behalf of our school, on behalf of everybody in our school, our staff, our faculty, our current students, our alumni, and our friends, I truly wish you all the very best as you start your next chapter. I am so excited to live in the future you all will create. Thank you for your time with us. Thank you for everything you've done. And thank you for everything you are going to do. Once again, congratulations. <laughs>